iPod, a TV de plasma, estamos cercados de objetos produzidos pelo talento de designers que despertam em nós o desejo da posse. Não importa se realmente temos necessidade, o bom designer sabe de nossa relação emocional com objetos. Desde o carro projetado para nos iludir com potência, até a nota de dinheiro que nos pede confiança. Ou o terno Armani, que sugere refinamento e posse de recursos para comprá-lo. O design permeia a sociedade industrial e de consumo, que nos define não pelo que somos, mas por aquilo que compramos e exibimos. O mundo do design é o de Dejan Sudjic, crítico cultural, ex-editor da revista Domus, ex-diretor da Bienal de Arquitetura de Veneza e autor, entre outros livros, de A Linguagem das Coisas, que discute como somos seduzidos pelos objetos que nos cercam. Sudge que tem a convivência diária com seu material de estudo, porque dirige o Museu do Design, em Londres, atração para 200 mil visitantes por ano, interessados em conhecer um pouco mais sobre objetos de nosso dia a dia, como foram criados e o que significam para nós. No museu, à beira do rio Tamiza, o milênio foi encontrar Sudjik para esta conversa. People always made things, and in the old days we used to call it craft. All of a sudden people start referring to it as design. When did that start and, and why did it start? People have a very different relationship with their possessions when things are made for them by an individual craftsman. You could have a chair made for you, a garment, a suit of armor, a sword, one at a time, where you actually go and see a maker, someone with great skill, who would do what you wanted for them. But of course it was very expensive. It was for the elite, for the wealthy. And the factory in the 19th century changed all that. It was when people started to make things in huge numbers. So the factory was expensive, but it meant because there were so many things produced that the object itself became cheap. And that's when the designer appeared as someone to fill that gap between the factory and the user. And that's when design started to come so much more important than ever been before. As a concept and as a terminology. Yes. Yeah. You know, your book makes it very clear that we live in a consumer society, in you know, a society where we're more often defined by what we buy instead of by what we are. To what extent do you think design has contributed to that situation? People have always used possessions for complicated reasons. One can go back to the Middle Ages in Europe and you would see people commissioning a suit of armor that they would never fight in, a sword they would never use in anger. They were made to look beautiful and extraordinary and elaborate, to be a sign or a symbol of people's power. And design is now being used in the same sort of way, to delineate an expensive car from a cheap one, to try and give you the visual clues to say something is special or not. And design, I guess, is a kind of, um, it's, an ambiguous, it's an ambiguous place. It's both about selling things, but also reflecting what people think about themselves. You, you also mentioned in your book that uh, uh, we accumulate more possessions than we actually need. Of course, we're talking about a segment of the society. And, but what do you mean? People just buy things just for, the, just for the sake of buying them and owning them? It's like an addiction. We are drunk on stuff. Um, we are urged to buy more things. We are given that sense of pleasure when we actually go to a store and we have something beautifully wrapped and we're seduced into buying it and then we put it away without using it. We buy possessions for our kids, toys, boxes for them that they never use. We buy gigantic kitchens that we never cook in. Everything is getting out of control. The spiral of consumption has become the primary role of the citizen, almost more than making. But does that affect poor people as well? Because a certain segment of society, of course, can afford to buy things that they don't even really need. But how about poorer people? Are they victims of the, of the design I, I, pressure as well? One, one could see this as, thing as, uh, as manufacturing want and creating that sense of exclusion that if you, if you can't have something or if you can't afford something, then you're in some way a second-class citizen, which is terrifying. But of course, one could also say that definitions of poverty keep shifting too. In Europe, um, the idea, there was an idea once that having a TV was a luxury, having a refrigerator was a luxury. It's now absolute minimum. You know, advertising professionals worldwide 
keep telling us that you, you don't sell the need, you sell the desire. To what extent do you think they use designers to sell the desire instead of the need? If you put it at its most brutal, designers are a profession who exist to make us want stuff we don't need. And there's always been this schizophrenia because designers have both believed that they're in business to create a utopia, a better world, but there's also designers who believe their job is to sell more stuff, to streamline the sales curve, as uh, Raymond Lowy, the great American designer, once put it. And Lowy was so proud of his design achievement, which was to double the sales of Lucky Strike Packs by changing the pack color from green to white. That's one extreme of what design can be. At the other, it's the people like William Morris who believe that design was a kind of moral crusade, which was about showing what was really valuable in a world which is constantly changing. Design is both those things, which is why, to me, it's so interesting. It's, it's interesting that we, we, we would like to think that we are aware of this process of buying the desire and falling for the trap that, you know, we're, we're not going to be victims of it. But we are, anyway. We all are, aren't we? I'm certainly a victim. I mean, I wrote this book partly out of a sense of um, trying to purge myself of the guilt, a kind of exorcism. I mean, it really got me going. I mean, the book really started when I had this kind of out-of-body experience at Heathrow Airport, uh, past the electronics duty-free shop. Not the kind of place you usually expect to be seduced, but I realized that I needed to buy a new laptop. Um, who would have thought you actually need to buy a new laptop every two years? And when I bought my first one, I thought it would be a lifetime purchase. It was so valuable in the same way that my father, of course, lived his whole life with one typewriter, which he bequeathed me, and I still keep for sentimental reasons. But there I was in the duty-free shop, trying to buy a new laptop, and there was a choice. There was the all-white laptop or the black one. And of course, as soon as I saw it, I knew I had to have that black one because black is the color of seriousness. Black is the color of guns, of typewriters, of, of um, mechanisms that don't need to seduce you to buy them, which of course is the most powerful kind of seduction there is. So I got my black apple, it was, and of course it cost slightly more, and I felt that sense of elation that I got it, but as soon as I got it out of the box, my eyes were opened. I suddenly realized that though this was the most perfect, rational, all black laptop computer, it had a white power cord, and suddenly it all went, started to go sour. And then, of course, as I started to use that machine, I realized that though it looked beautiful, uh, designers still haven't really quite come to terms with the fact that um, humans have skin, and skin, when it touches mechanical objects, starts to leave greasy traces. And so my perfect utopian object very quickly was covered in crumbs, in dandruff, in grease, and this wonderful object suddenly started to look really sick. And that's something, that's a, that's a factor which wasn't always the case. There was a time when our possessions grew old gracefully. Compare that experience to the kind of Nikon that cameras used, the kind of Nikon camera that photographers used to use back in the 60s. They were made of brass with a black, with black paint layer, which as it got older and it was used, started to chip away to reveal little traces of the bronze underneath. It got better as it got older, like a great pair of denim jeans. The stuff we make now is designed to wear out so fast that we feel that we need to buy a new one every two years. It's a, it, oh, one uh, a sentence you mentioned in the book that called my attention was that you said that design is used to make things that are cheap to produce seem expensive. That's the, mass, that's the impact of mass production, that you spend a lot of money on a machine to make something in very large numbers. So each thing that you've made is rather cheap, which is the exact opposite from the way that things used to be, that a craftsman would spend a great deal of time making something very precious. Compare a mass-produced car, a Ford or a Volkswagen, to a Bentley or a Rolls-Royce. The Bentley is made in hundreds. The Ford or the Volkswagen is made in hundreds of thousands. So of course, objectively speaking, the mass-produced car is a better car because it's actually got much more chance to actually use new technologies, to have many more people making things for it. The luxury car is made by hand and it's, it's really used to actually using visuals, visual tricks to make you feel it's actually worth the cash. Mm. The, and where does the question of beauty come into into the picture is is a uh, is good design supposed to create beauty or, or is it just you know, it's just enough to to offer a solution for use does it have to have beauty well the idea that um, truth is beauty is a kind of ancient philosophical position which 
goes back through people like Keats to kind of the, the Greeks, there is a sense that if you actually, uh, if a designer analyzes a problem carefully enough and comes up with a functional correct answer, then it will automatically also be beautiful. Now I find that quite hard to take because you're never quite sure what function really is. Is the function of a car to get you from A to B or is it to impress your girlfriend? Is the function of a suit to keep you warm or dry or is it to make you feel good? Those are both kinds of function. They're emotional functions as well as practical functions. When we look at, uh, you know, at a painting, be it from uh, Michelangelo or a struggling artist, we don't ask, what is this for? You know, we just take it for what it is, for, for, for the beauty of it, for what it, the, the feeling we get from it. Uh, does uh, design, the object that is designed, does it have to have a goal, an objective? Uh, does it have to be for something? There is an interesting tension between design and what we call art. I mean, art springs from religion and magic, basically. And even now, it's still got that flavor. You know, it's that sense of doing something which is apart from part of a different world. And design is, one could say, cursed by the burden of utility, that there is something in all cultures that values the useless above the useful. If we think about it, um, most cultures have had a elite which is based on those who don't have to work and a mass who do work to support them. And the elite show that they don't need to work by what they wear, how they conduct themselves. And that, I think, spills over into all forms of culture. So art has no utility, therefore it's seen as a higher prestige than design, which has utility. And so now we're in the kind of strange position where designers are busy trying to reinvent themselves, not as people who produce something useful, but who produce something which has some kind of other cultural flavor to it. The idea of a limited edition design, for example, has become very popular among certain circles, which is a very odd idea. It's, um, you know, it's turning a sofa into a piece of sculpture. But it, it does have to have a quantity, right? When you're talking about design, you cannot talk about unique pieces of can you and still refer to it as a product of design. Um, there are now designers who produce what they call limited editions. Mark Newson, for example, um, a very gifted Australian designer, produced something called the Lockheed Lounge, um, which is a piece of furniture, which um, was made in an edition of seven, plus three artist proofs, which is a new concept for sofas, I would say, one might say, second-hand showroom material. And uh, one of those recently sold at auction for one and a half million dollars. It was like, well, like when uh, Andy Warhol uh, painted Campbell's soup. It, it, here's a product of a design, which is the Campbell's soup, uh, the can itself, and the specific design. Then he paints it, and that product of design becomes, uh, the product of art becomes a product of design. It, it, it's all mixed, isn't it? Well, you could say that Warhol was making art that was about design and the world around him. Although with Warhol, it was also particularly um, acute, acute a problem because he began his career as a fashion illustrator doing fashion illustrations for magazines. And then he made a very smart career move which to get into art, which of course is rather more rewarding for a successful artist. Would, and then there's the case of uh, Philip Stark, who, uh, the, the designer is a celebrity, in this case is capable of transforming anonymous objects in, uh, just by adding his signature to it. And then uh, it's, but, but it's fashion, more of a commerce than a trick. But fashion is a kind of ruthless process which uh, there's nothing less fashionable than last year's fashion. And there is something about the, uh, the cult of the designer which can start to look ridiculous. And the sense of kind of someone caricaturing themselves and repeating themselves also becomes complex. But that's, that's the way we work. We are now pre-programmed to look for new things all the time. Daqui a pouco, você acompanha mais a entrevista com o diretor do Museu do Design de Londres, Dayan Sudjit. Are there creators in the area of design that, that excite you, that uh, tell you something? To me, the most interesting designers are those who can operate on several levels at the same time. So that there is a sense of ingenuity in what they do and that they understand materials, but they also have some kind of conceptual grasp of what they're doing. I mean, someone like Ettore Sotsas, who sadly died a couple of years ago, but he was the Italian designer who designed Italy's first mainframe computer for Olivetti when his previous experience had been little more than doing ceramic vases. He started Memphis, the group which sort of brought postmodernism to 
uh, furniture and design, but was still making, in his studio at the same time, very businesslike machinery. And I think someone who actually has both those strands in them are the most interesting ones to me. Geographically speaking, wh where are the important centers nowadays? It, besides Italy, would you say uh, New York, perhaps? Or? It's become, I mean, design has become a global process in which people travel so much. Um, one has to say that it's not so much Italy that's a center for design as Milan, a city which attracts ambitious designers from all over the world in the same way that London does. And because manufacturing is now such a diversified process, people can operate from almost anywhere. Um, I think those cultures which are interested in design are the ones which are looking towards a future economy. And one has to say that the next places one look at as centers for design would certainly be Shanghai, Sao Paulo, um, you know, the places which are now moving into upscale manufacturing, that they've moved beyond the days of generic, cheap and cheerful copies of other people's originals into inventing their own brands and, design, and supporting their own design cultures. You, you seem to uh, attach an emotional charge to, to objects. You say, for instance, that, that objects have gender. Of course, if you take the Latin languages, objects have, do have gender. Uh, a chair is fem feminine, it's a, and, a, and a book is a masculine, but you, in English you don't have that, but you still think there's an emotional attachment that separates male and female in objects. Look at the way that um, razors are designed to look masculine or feminine. You immediately know uh, a razor, electric razor, which is designed for contact with a man's chin as opposed to a woman's leg. But why does the female one have to have soft curves and possibly pink, and uh, the masculine one will be brushed steel, maybe with black dots on it? I mean, these are visual clues which trigger certain ideas and responses in our minds, perhaps because it's simply about familiarity, or is there something generic, genetically modified in them? It's, you know, it's it's there. Um, design is also used to kind of suggest values, to make something look expensive. I mean, for me, the classic example is the design of a banknote, which is in some ways the classic conjuring trick of making a worthless rectangle of paper look like it's worth something, and not just worth something, but worth something in a specifically American, Brazilian, European, British kind of way. Look at a British banknote compared with a dollar bill. Uh, the greenback looks like it could have been designed as the label for a cigar box in the 19th century. It's green, the color of money. Um, it's got lots of very elaborate steel engravings showing portraits of inevitably men with lots of unnecessary facial hair. The British banknote sort of harks back to the 19th century in a different sort of way. Some cultures are more confident about themselves. The Swiss franc is uh, bold enough to actually dispense with the usual um, typographic mannerisms and uh, does it in a much more modern way. But the, but the main thing is we need to trust that piece of paper with things printed on it, that it's got more than... Oscar Wilde once said, only a fool doesn't judge by appearances. <laughs> so it's the, the, the appearance of a banknote is important to also to build trust in it. It's, it's worth more than paper. My, fam my family come from what was once called Yugoslavia. And I remember being particularly struck, even before the appalling bloodshed of the wars of Yugoslav succession had broken out, even before the Croats and the Slovenes had armies, they'd gone off to have themselves banknotes designed to show they were not part of the former Yugoslavia. Old Soviet bloc Yugoslavia, it had currency which was embellished with portraits of heroic workers and peasants, sheaves of wheat, power stations, scientists. And of course, the Croats made money look just like Deutsch, Deutschmarks with Baroque composers on them or um, 19th century poets. You show who you are by what you look and by your insignia and how things appear. Move into another object that is more to do with my profession than to do with, let's deal with television. Well, discussions about television normally deal with the content, you know, what's shown on television, what effects it has on people, but you have focused on the object itself, the set, and the evolution of the set through, through, through the ages. So, in a way, you think that our relationship with that object, television, has changed with time? In the early days of television, the object itself was treated like a piece of furniture, uh, faced in, in wood veneer, standing on legs in the corner of a room, perhaps like a household shrine. There was only one, 
uh, maybe in the entire street, so it wasn't just the family came in to look at it. You know, groups of neighbors might come in to, to worship at this shrine. When it was switched off, it was hidden under some kind of cloth to actually protect its screen. And then suddenly, transistorization allowed it to leap off its legs onto the floor, which somehow created a less formal relationship. You weren't worshiping at the feet of the TV set, except that you were, because before the days of the remote, you had to actually get on your hands and knees to change the channel. Then the remote changes our relationship with it once more. We're now in a time where TV is everywhere and it's becoming more and more invisible. We still haven't quite worked out what to do with a flat screen because a TV is not a picture and yet the way that we now usually use flat screens is to pin them on the wall as if they were a picture frame with some terrible piece of cable dangling down the wall in front of it. We haven't quite worked out what to do with it yet. You used to be a, a critic of architecture for, for the Observer for many years and uh and you're still in touch with that world. And now you're here, director of the Design Museum. Where do these two worlds meet, you know, architecture and design? I've always tried to say that architecture and design and other forms of visual culture are part of a, the same world. The trouble is most of those members of that world don't believe it, and there's a kind of cultural ghetto around architecture, around design, around art, and for me, the point of being a journalist and a critic was to try to communicate that design and architecture are too important to leave just to this priesthood. And the museum is also trying to talk about those things, to actually show that design is about everyday life. It's a way to understand the world around us. It's, it's a question that obviously, as you know, it, it takes a special significance in Brazil this year because we've got the, the 50 year anniversary of Brasilia. And people keep thinking, you know, what. Is that architecture? Is that design? Is that a combination of things? Is there architecture in the, in the overall? Is it design for each building? Where does it all meet? Well, the building of Brasilia was undoubtedly a piece of creative direction by uh, Kubitschek, who one could say was an art director, nation builder, in the same way that's happened in other nations. One could say in Turkey, Ataturk created a modern state, moved the capital from Istanbul to Ankara, imported many European architects to build it. Um, one could say that the Shah of Iran did that previously. And obviously, the Brazilian constitution for many years was committing itself to moving the capital once more. But for Kubitschek to actually deliver that with the team that did it, he was making a huge statement about what Brazil was, about looking inland rather than back to Europe, about modernity um, and architecture and design the way the city looks. is a huge part of that. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Se quiser mais detalhes da entrevista, veja o blog do Milênio no site da Globo News.